here for seven years uh, since uh, 2015. And uh, so that, uh, basically I'm, you know, with great pleasure to introduce you the Nobel Symposium delegation. Uh, we just had a, a wonderful event in Stellenbosch last week for the launch of Nobel in Africa. And uh, now I'm bringing five distinguished guests uh, to, to our university to engage with our faculty and students and so on. So I hope you can take this opportunity to talk to them uh, as much as you can and to introduce yourself and introduce your research, okay? So uh, without further delay, let me just uh, uh, get my uh, uh, head of school, uh, Dr. Ross Robinson, to give a few words, please. Yeah, Come over there. yeah please. please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yunzin. I appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the School of Chemistry and Physics. I'd like to start just briefly by thanking uh, Francesco and Yunzi for all the hard work that they've done to organize this event and a lot of other people that have helped out. So Dr. Frost, Thomas Conrad, and many, many other colleagues. So thank you for all of your hard work. But uh, I'd like to not take a lot of your time today. What I'd really like to do is just welcome our distinguished guests from all around the world. Welcome to the University of KwaZulu-Natal and to Durban. And we look forward to engaging with you over the next few days. So thank you very much and welcome to the school. Thank you. Okay, so... Um... So basically, we are soon with uh, with uh, Professor Neil Turok's talk. Uh, Neil, can you share your screen? Uh, I still have, can't uh, you can see you to share your screen uh, and open your camera, please. Okay, there it is. Okay, so um, I would just remind you that uh, in the evening we'll have a public outreach uh, talk in the Senate chamber by Professor Moen uh, Jensen from Denmark and Professor Angelo Wupiani from where's Andrew? Where's Andrew? Andrew there over there uh, from Rome. And tomorrow we'll have uh, two public lectures also at the Senate chamber from ten to twelve. So uh, uh, by Professor Eric Anru from Sweden and uh, uh, Professor Luca Gametoni from Italy. Yeah. So uh, so please, uh, you know, make make yourself and, and and let your friends know that we have this exciting event. So without further ado, let me uh, quickly introduce you the, to the speaker now, Professor Neil Trog. Uh, you can see here. Let me just. Uh... Double click. Yeah, this is Neil. Yes, uh, Neil is a, is a very famous cosmologist. He is currently the inaugural chair, Higgs, Higgs chair of theoretical physics at the University of Edinburgh. He was also the uh, previous director uh, of the Premier Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada, also the inaugural director of the famous African Institute for Mathematical Science in Cape Town. So, um, I mean, he has a long list of awards and et cetera. Um, and I wouldn't, uh, you know, to repeat, uh, you know, this, this, this thing. I think I send you uh, his uh, basically a brief introduction on email, et cetera, and also uh, here on poster, so you can read out if you're interested. So um, that's new. So then later on, we'll have another speaker, Armita, uh, who will talk about biophysics. So I will introduce Armita in the after news talk. So Neil, now let's uh, uh, now the floor is yours. Yours. Let me uh, let me share your screen. Let me uh, can I go back to this screen sharing? Uh, let me. Uh, is your screen being shared, Neil? Uh, not yet. Yes. Right? Can <laughs> yes. 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 Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear, but I can only see your photo, um, your 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 uh, video. But uh, can you share your screen? I am sharing. Uh, you are sharing. Uh, yes. Very top left. Ah, sweet. Okay. Okay, there it is. Okay, Neil, please. And uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yin Jie. Um, can, can you hear me properly? Yes, we can. All right, excellent. So, uh, so let me begin. I, uh, I sincerely apologize for not being there. I would have loved to be there in person, um, but uh, and we'll have to make do with Zoom. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, in fact, I spent six months in uh, Durban as a small boy uh, because my mother went to prison. Uh, in South Africa for resisting apartheid. And my father was already in prison. And so I came to Durban and spent six months with my grandmother who, who lived there in Kloof. So uh, I'm very fond of uh, Durban and Natal and of course, South Africa. 
uh, and, and it's a place of my roots. So I'm going to tell you about something very new, uh, very radical, and to me at least very exciting. Uh, this is a new theory of the universe. Uh, when I emphasize new, that means it's not yet accepted. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an idea regarding how the universe might uh, be arranged. And uh, it's an idea which I have developed with my younger collaborator, Latham Boyle. He's at Perimeter Institute. And if you look online, you'll find a series of papers about this topic. So, uh, okay. Let me just begin by emphasizing that mathematics and astronomy, i.e. understanding the universe, uh, began in Africa. Uh, the oldest mathematical artifacts in the world are African and, uh, and the oldest uh, artifacts uh, which were built using mathematics. And in my view, it's absolutely time for Africa to reclaim its uh, pioneering efforts in mathematical science. Uh, and it's very important to do so now because mathematical science really is driving uh, the economy of the future and not just the economy, but uh, the information and ultimately the power in the world is being determined by those people who have access to uh, mathematical science and all its spin-offs like artificial intelligence and, uh, and so on. So it's really vital for Africa to invest in its talented youth. Africa has an advantage compared to the rest of the world in having a young population. And uh, in uh, several decades time, in fact, a good fraction of the world's youth will be African. So it's not just vital for Africa, it's vital for the world that we invest in training and uh, providing opportunities for Africa's youth in science and maths. And that is the objective of the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, which I helped to found. And we are aiming to graduate uh, 10,000 uh, young scientists uh, in Africa in the next decade at master's and PhD level. Now, why do we need a new theory of the universe? So let me briefly describe the current consensus. Uh, the current consensus is that the Big Bang was not describable by science. It's too weird. Uh, the whole universe was at a point that was the beginning of time, whatever that means. It's almost a contradiction. And uh, then people have developed a, a model called the inflation model, which essentially amounts to throwing in some explosive uh, just after the beginning of time. And that explosive blows the universe up to a very large size and makes it smooth and flat in agreement with what we see. Uh, that uh, theory of inflation has dominated the field for 40 years. Uh, and recent observations are now testing that theory in an absolutely amazing way. They're showing us the universe on large scales at high accuracy and allowing us to test this theory's prediction. Well, the theory is not doing that well because one of its predictions is there should be what are called tensor modes. These are also called long wavelength gravitational waves, which would have been produced by this explosive expansion of the universe. So that's a unavoidable signature of this inflationary epoch. And then the question is quantitative. How much of that signal do you expect to see? And so that is measured by this number R. R measures the fraction of uh, deviation from uniformity in the microwave background in, in the radiation from the Big Bang due to these long wavelength gravitational waves. So I had a bet with Stephen Hawking that, uh, that this number would be less than 5%. And uh, Stephen was a very brave uh, guy in making bets. He bet it would be greater than 5%. And unfortunately, he didn't live to see the results, but you can see here are the latest experiments 
showing that this number is less than 3%. It keeps decreasing. And these models of inflation are progressively being ruled out. So the consensus view is not doing very well uh, in, con in uh, comparison with the data. But that's not the real reason why I think we need an alternative. The real reason is that the consensus, consensus model leads to wild explosive expansion across space and uh, to something which people call the inflationary multiverse. So in their picture, we live in one of these little bubbles. And so we see certain laws of physics, we see a certain um, features in nature. But according to this model, uh, there are multiple universes uh, called the multiverse. And it's kind of random which one we ended up. Um, and so in my view, this is really a uh, catastrophic uh, failure of the theory. It doesn't predict anything. Um, and we see no evidence from observations of a multiverse. So I'm deeply skeptical. And I think this is a dead end in my humble opinion. So I'm motivated to start again and to look at the data afresh and try to see what it is telling us. Now, the data is absolutely amazing. As I mentioned before, we can fit the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, so here we are in the solar system. And whereas, as we look outwards, we look further out in space and further back in time. And what we see is the uh, formation of structure. This is this web-like structure, which led to galaxies and then and stars and planets and, uh, and places like the Earth. But uh, when we look outwards and, and map the whole visible universe, we see an amazingly simple uh, object. Uh, I like to say that the whole universe on large scales is simpler even than one bacterium. You know, bacterium is quite a complicated thing. Often they can move, they can respond to stimuli. We don't really understand how they work uh, in the sense of being able to predict what they will do. They're very unpredictable. But the universe on large scales is utterly simple and predictable. And that's why I'm encouraged to make uh, theories of it, mathematical theories, which can then be tested by observation. So the large scale universe is characterized by just five numbers, three for the energy content. Uh, we have radiation in the form of photons and, uh, and then we have baryons, uh, atomic nuclei, and of course, electrons making up atoms. There's a single number that characterizes how many um, nu atomic nuclear nucleons there are per photon. There's a second number which characterizes how much dark matter there is. There's very strong evidence for additional matter apart from uh, atoms in the universe. And uh, that's characterized by a certain number. And then there's the energy, of, the energy density of the dark energy. A uh, very, very simple form of energy, which now comprises about 70% of all the energy in the universe. As well as these three numbers, we see the impact of gravity in the gravitational potential. This is just Newton's uh, gravitational potential. It fluctuates from place to place in the universe with an amplitude, which is about three parts in 100,000. And this leads to temperature variation of about one part in 100,000 on large scales. And then we have a small tilt, just 0 0.02, that as you go to longer wavelengths or a smaller wave number k, you see slightly larger uh, amplitude of fluctuations. Very many quantities are consistent with zero. Um, and uh, so the universe has turned out to be stunningly simple uh, observationally. Here it is. Here's the picture of the cosmic microwave background. So it's projected onto this oval shape, but it actually represents a sphere which surrounds us. And so this is like a picture of the Earth uh, in an atlas. 
but uh, but it's the opposite because we're surrounded by the sky and now we've projected it onto this oval shape. And what you see in the picture, these tremendously simple random pattern of hot spots and cold spots. And you might say there's, you know, this is just random. Um, is that is that comprehensible? It just looks, uh, you know, a random mess. However, physicists are very good at making sense of uh, apparently random phenomena. And what you do with this pattern is you take a Fourier transform. You do that because the normal modes, the modes of vibration of the universe are actually um, like the modes of a bell. You know, if you strike a bell, it oscillates at uh, various frequencies and the universe likewise oscillates at various frequencies. And you reveal these modes by taking the Fourier transform of this map and plotting the power as a function of a wave number. This number L is essentially the wave number on the sphere. It's the spherical harmonic index. And so here's the power as a function of wave number. You see these beautiful oscillations. That's just the oscillations of a dense plasma of radiation um, as uh, coming out of the Big Bang and then vibrating on various uh, scales. I was very fortunate in the 90s, this was a new field, uh, the prediction of these uh, power spectra. And the previous literature people had claimed, uh, including actually Yinjie's uh, supervisor, who I won't uh, mention by name, they had claimed that there would be no polarization uh, or actually no correlation between the polarization of the sky and the temperature. Well, they were wrong. There is a correlation and you can calculate it. And it's a rather beautiful quantity because it has no free parameters at all. Once you fit the cosmology to the lower curve, the upper curve is absolutely predicted. And so we did those calculations uh, long before they were measured. And uh, the experimenters at the time said that's too difficult to measure. You see, this is a temperature variation in micro Kelvin. So that's one millionth of a degree Kelvin. And they said, we can't measure it. Uh, but uh, 10 years later, they were measuring it routinely. So um, never believe an experimentalist when they say they can't do something uh, because uh, 10 years later, they will be able to do the things they didn't imagine being able to do before. So, uh, so here it is, it's amazingly simple. And uh, these red curves are entirely predicted by Einstein's theory of gravity and our understanding of plasma physics developed in the 1920s, um, plus those five numbers I told you before. So that's the large scale universe. Uh, what's happening on the small scales, on the tiniest scales we know of? So if you look on subatomic and subnuclear scales, at the laws of physics, they're remarkably simple. And actually it's the same story. The largest ever experiment was built, the Large Hadron Collider, to test the laws of physics on the smallest scales. It's basically a huge microscope and uh, it revealed the laws of physics on subatomic nuclei scales. And this is what it showed us. It was uh, in precise agreement with theoretical expectation and there was absolutely no evidence for anything beyond what we already knew. So on both very large scales and very small scales, the universe has turned out to be surprisingly simple and in absolute agreement with the laws which were previously known. Some people are very disappointed with that. They say, oh dear, you know, we, we haven't learned anything from uh, these experiments. I feel the opposite. I feel that what we've learned is that nature is cleverer than we are, and it's got away with uh, the laws of physics being incredibly economical. And uh, our job is to nevertheless make sense of the universe within these uh, fixed framework of uh, the standard model of physics that's shown in this slide and the laws of gravity as described by Einstein. So the universe is utterly predictable at the extremes, very small scales, very large scales. 
And actually, being a theorist, I'm allowed to extrapolate uh, to extremely small scales. Uh, this is the Planck length, much smaller than an atomic nucleus. And what we learn is that gravity provides a limit to what we can ever see on small scales. Uh, that if you tried, if you built a microscope to see the Planck length, the light would be so intense that you would only succeed in creating black holes. You could not see anything as small as this. You would just make black holes. On very large scales, there's a similar constraint that the laws of physics, apparently due to dark energy, apparently prevent us seeing anything larger than this scale ever. And the reason again is gravity, but instead of the attractive gravity, which causes collapse on small scales, we have repulsive gravity on large scales. That's a property of the dark energy that pushes the universe away from us so fast we can't see it. So as far as we can tell, the laws on small scales and large scales are very simple. Of course, the laws of physics and science are very complicated in the middle. And if you take the geometric mean of these two scales fixed by gravity, the lower limit and the upper limit of what we can see, the geometric mean is actually the size of a living cell. And this, is, this represents the most complex and unpredictable things in the universe. And of course, uh, life in, in the form of human beings is creating artificial intelligence and uh, future complex structures, uh, who knows what they will do, but all this is going on on the scales in the middle. Uh, so sometimes I call this the messy middle. Uh, physics is simple on very small scales and very large scales, but very messy in between. So here are all the laws of physics, uh, which we know of on small scales and large scales. This includes everything, I won't go through it, but it's gravity, it's uh, the forces, uh, the particles, and this uh, Higgs field, which, um, so I'm very privileged to hold the Higgs chair. Uh, Peter Higgs was an unusual person who uh, realized that there's this strange substance called the Higgs field, and uh, this Higgs field uh, endows particles with uh, some of their key properties. My point of view is that perhaps this story is nearly complete. Whenever we've looked recently for deviations, new particles, new phenomena, we have found that in fact, this equation I've written down uh, is enough to explain everything. Our job is to understand this equation more deeply and how it manages to be consistent, even though there are apparently uh, severe problems within it. And I won't dwell too deeply on these problems, but it's the job of theorists like me to get rid of these problems. My point of view is that the most basic puzzles uh, about the universe are our best clues to how to uh, interpret and understand these laws of physics. The biggest puzzle is the Big Bang singularity, that the entire universe uh, popped out of a point 13.7 um, billion years ago. Uh, and uh, that seems indescribable. But our new resolution of the Big Bang singularity uses certain mathematical properties. I won't dwell on them. Uh, and so I, th and I think understanding the Big Bang singularity is actually key to uh, to understanding the, the state of the universe today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the second big puzzle. What determines the large scale geometry of the universe? Why is it so symmetrical and flat? Uh, Einstein's theory allows the universe to be very curved and warped like a sphere or a saddle, a horse saddle, but it isn't. It is uh, absolutely flat on very large scales to very high precision, about one part in 100,000. And uh, the resolution of this, I'm going to describe to you in a moment. There's another big puzzle. How do you couple quantum fields like the electromagnetic field and its quanta, which are photons, to gravity? 
As soon as you try to do that, you discover there's an infinite energy in the vacuum. And uh, theorists like me have become quite good at ignoring this infinity. But in fact, that is kind of uh, uh, ignoring a huge clue. Um, and uh, the resolution of that is a new cancellation mechanism. I won't have time to talk about this, but it, it's it's a bit technical. You'll find it in our, in our papers, but it's, it's very exciting. Uh, and then the others, I'll talk a bit about dark matter. And what I'm going to argue is that in fact, we already know what the dark matter is. There's no great mystery. Uh, there's a clear candidate and uh, for strange reasons, more or less uh, sociological reasons, it was overlooked uh, since the 1970s. And so I'll explain to you what that is. Now, the large scale geometry of the universe. So Roger Penrose, who's a recent uh, Nobel Prize winner for understanding the inevitability of the formation of black holes, uh, Roger Penrose um, de describes the beginning of the universe with this picture. So here is the creator. And you see they are choosing a very special point in the space of all possible universes. And this is a, a huge puzzle, uh, which uh, we now claim to have resolved. Um, in order to show you how uh, to motivate our solution and describe our solution, think of a much simpler problem. Why is the Earth quite flat uh, when you look at it locally, the surface of the Earth? Why is it quite flat? And uh, so if you travel uh, five or 10 kilometers, uh, you know, and you make a map of your surroundings, uh, they are pretty, pretty flat. And as you see in, in this picture uh, that NASA made uh, from space, the Earth is really like a polished marble. It's beautifully round and smooth, uh, slightly distorted because it's spinning, but, uh, but really it's extremely round and extremely flat. Why, why is that? Well, one explanation is that somebody made it that way. You know, there was a, a god or somebody came along and they liked the idea of a round Earth and so they polished it and they hammered it into shape. Now, uh, the inflation mechanism is a little bit like this. You want to understand why the universe is big and smooth. And so you introduce some dynamite <clears throat> to blow it up and uh, smoothen it out. But in fact, that's entirely unnecessary because there's a much better explanation. And the explanation is that the earth is very large. It's made of about 10 to the 50 atoms. Uh, that's more or less an accident of history, that, that it's a, a very large object. And then secondly, you have gravity pulling the atoms inwards and, and down and inwards towards the center, and you have dissipation. So if a mountain collapses, you know, it stays down. It doesn't bounce like a rubber ball. It stays down. That's because of dissipation. And its energy, the potential energy due to gravity, gravity in the mountain is, is transferred into heat and sound. And there's so many more ways to distribute that energy among the atoms of the earth, that uh, which is what we call entropy, the number of ways of distributing energy, so much more entropy in, in putting all that energy into heat that actually the mountains uh, uh, tend to collapse and, and never form. And so ultimately it's thermodynamics and entropy, which explains why the earth is so round. Now, Stephen Hawking, who was a close friend of mine, and um, I brought him to South Africa um, uh, in 2008. And um, he uh, introduced, I was very lucky to introduce him to Nelson Mandela. Um, and if you go to Ames, there's a beautiful sculpture of Stephen Hawking in the, in the entrance of the Institute. Um, that was the only time he came to Africa. But Stephen Hawking probably had the greatest insight of any uh, theorist in the 20th century into how we reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics. And his great discovery was this field of black hole thermodynamics. 
where he pointed out or realized that a black hole, that's this object in the middle, is after all not completely black. It has a temperature which is inversely proportional to its mass, and it has an entropy. And you can think of this as the number of ways the black hole could have formed. Uh, and the entropy is proportional to its area. And here, zeros and ones have been placed all over the area to indicate that there are many possible states for the black hole. So Hawking showed black holes have entropies. His calculation is still very mysterious. Uh, it, it uses some very elegant mathematical tricks, but uh, it leaves many people nervous as to what it actually means. Uh, we don't probably, we don't understand the quantum theory of gravity. And so you can think of Hawking's picture of black hole entropy as basically a glimpse into uh, the future of quantum gravity, uh, where we, we don't really understand the foundations. Uh, a parallel you might draw is the ideal gas law. You know, this was understood long before statistical mechanics. Uh, it was understood that the ideal gas law works and indeed the concept of entropy and so on. It was only much later when people understood um, that matter is made out of atoms and uh, that energy is quantized that uh, people could actually give uh, rigorous de mathematical definitions of entropy. So Hawking's work is sort of a glimpse into the, into the quantum gravity without providing the foundation. So recently we used the same Hawking trick uh, and uh, found some new analytical solutions for a realistic set of cosmologies, including radiation, non-relativistic matter like the dark matter and the baryons, uh, dark energy, and space curvature. So we were able to solve the equations for the universe analytically for the first time. And using them, we calculated the gravitational entropy. So we calculated the number of states corresponding to a given set of cosmological parameters. This was very surprising that we were able to do this. And, uh, and the result was even more surprising. The result was that the most likely universes are flat, homogeneous, and isotropic on large scales. You don't need any mechanism like inflation to explain that. Uh, it's just a consequence of thermodynamics. So I'm not going to give the details. It's quite a technical subject and just refer you to our papers. But as you can imagine, this has created quite a stir in the field because the standard explanation, which has held for 40 years, is apparently unnecessary. Now, uh, the second topic is how do we couple gravity to quantum fields? Uh, as soon as you try to do this, you encounter profound difficulties, and this has been known for a long time, at least since the 1970s and long before, that the vacuum energy is infinite and actually even breaks Lorentz invariance. It's more like uh, quantum fluctuations of a radiation fluid uh, in the vacuum. So people have discovered ways to subtract it, but, uh, but it leaves you very uneasy because you have this infinity, which gravity responds to because gravity is sensitive to all forms of energy. And then you have to remove, remove it before you can do anything. Uh, it's worse than this because when you place the standard model of uh, quantum fields on a curved space-time uh, like the universe, then the symmetries of the theory are spoiled by these quantum mechanical infinities. And in fact, this leads to great trouble when you couple it to gravity, uh, you're going to get all kinds of infinities and, uh, and difficulties in the quantum theory. String theory and supergravity have been successful at somewhat reducing these problems, but at a very high price. You need a huge number of extra fields, particles, and even dimensions of space. And again, this uh, points to a multiverse, which uh, makes the theory completely unpredictive. So we've recently discovered a much more economical approach. It's uh, again, a little technical. It involves something called dimension zero fields. Um, and I just refer you to our papers. 
So I'm not saying our uh, our solution is uh, is the best one or the only one. I I hope above all that our work um, inspires some young person, much younger person, to create an even more uh, radical approach uh, to unifying the laws of physics, uh, which again will hopefully be much more economical than the theories which have dominated in recent years. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the dark matter. Um, here again is the standard model. I mentioned that in, in my view, there's an obvious explanation of the dark matter. Well, here it is. You see, these three right-handed neutrinos do not couple to the uh, forces, the gauge particles, which mediate forces, strong, weak, and electro electromagnetic forces. These right-handed neutrinos don't even couple to those forces. They couple to gravity, and they couple to the Higgs boson. So they're very weakly coupled, and therefore they would appear dark. If you shine light on them, it won't bounce off them. They are dark. So something we realized recently is that one of them uh, can very easily be the dark matter. Uh, the way this works is that the left-handed neutrinos, which are very light, would occasionally oscillate into or transform quantum mechanically into a very heavy right-handed neutrino. And because it's so heavy, they can't stay there. It's only a virtual particle. They have to, it has to oscillate back into a left-handed neutrino. And these oscillations are only possible because of the Higgs field in the vacuum. So this has been known, this mechanism has been known for a long time. It's called the seesaw mechanism because the heavier you make the right-handed neutrino, the weaker the oscillations, and therefore uh, the lighter the mass of the left-handed neutrino. So by being, making the right-handed one heavy, you make the left-handed one light. That's why it's called the seesaw mechanism. So that's been known for a long time. Now, if I want one of these to be the dark matter, I want it to be stable, so it should not decay. And so I actually have to switch off one of these couplings to make the right-handed neutrino stable. If I do that, it will be stable, it can be the dark matter, and it will only couple to gravity. How do you predict its abundance? Uh, this was our new contribution to the picture well, when you describe the Big Bang, you realize that there are actually, in, in a mathematical sense, two sides of it. And you can calculate how many right-handed neutrinos there are uh, created by the Big Bang itself. They're created by a kind, as a kind of Hawking radiation from the Big Bang. If their mass is the right value, then they fit the observations. Now that's not a prediction, it's just a fit, because very hard to test this experimentally, it's too heavy for any accelerator. But uh, the, uh, the, the fact that it's stable actually implies that one of the light neutrinos is massless. You see, if I switch off this coupling, then the right-handed guy will be stable, but equally the corresponding left-handed guy won't get a mass. It, it, it is exactly massless. And that prediction will be tested in the next three to five years, actually using galaxy surveys. It's quite amazing that the most precise way we have of measuring the mass of very light neutrinos is by measuring the strength of gravity in galaxy clusters. So here's the data. We know mass differences. We do not know the absolute zero of, of the mass scale for the three observed light neutrinos. Here's the very latest data. Uh, and they indeed favor the lightest possible value for the lightest neutrino. They favor zero mass for the lightest neutrino. In the next um, three to five years, this will become very precise. And if the data continues to favor a massless light neutrino, the, the, the lightest one being massless, then our theory will be uh, easily, I would say, the most compelling candidate for dark matter. Here is a telescope in uh, Chile, an amazing new telescope. The prediction is that the 
total mass of the light neutrinos is 60 milli electron volts. That's a prediction if the lightest one is massless. And their sensitivity is going to be about 12 milli electron volts. Okay, so um, we're getting to the level of precision where this will be tested uh, very uh, precisely. Summary, we have a new theory. It's more predictive than the standard uh, version. It provides the most economical yet explanation for the dark matter, the large scale geometry of the universe, how gravity couples more consistently to quantum fields. And I haven't really talked about this. We can predict the density perturbations we see in the sky from first principles. There are a bunch of other problems which it addresses. A lot remains to be done, but these are encouraging signs. And nia bonga. Hey, uh, Neil Bunga, uh, Neil, thank you for your talk. And uh, now I think the, you know, the, the time is for the floor for, for our audience. Uh, any question from audience? Yes, Professor, who's running us? Who? I'm talking to the screen. Wait, wait, wait. Connection, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, any questions? You? No? Okay, uh, uh, so two hands, I see two hands. Maybe uh, uh, Matthew, please. So, sorry, thank sorry, you. Matthew. Thank you. So Neil, thank you for your talk, uh, very enlightening. I, I think I listened to it, uh, the online version where you, you, the talk you did with Brian Keaton recently. And yes. I listened to the entire thing. And uh, so, uh, very enlightening. And I think you've given some hint of what the dark matter is, and uh, that's been quite an unknown thing. What I want to know is: is the uh, universe accelerating? Expansion yeah. is the expansion accelerating. Yes, it seems to be. Um, it's very dramatic. But the way it was first discovered was from. Um, uh, plotting the um, luminosity of supernovae. And so you can imagine that a supernova, which is an exploding uh, star, a supernova has a standard brightness. And so if you see supernovae at different distances or rather at different brightnesses, you can interpret the brightness as a measure of the distance. And people have become quite sophisticated about doing that. So supernovae, what is called a standard candle. Um, and then if you measure their brightness and their velocity away from us, just by the Doppler shift, uh, then you can infer the expansion history of the universe. So that was the first discovery. I'll tell you the thing which convinced me that the universe is accelerating which is the, that there is another completely different physical consequence of acceleration. You know, when matter clumps, it makes a region of higher density, it also makes a gravitational potential. And so a photon falling into that potential becomes blue shifted, it gains energy. Now it turns out that if there is no acceleration, no dark energy, that when it, that the gravitational potentials are static, that a cluster forms and then its potential is fixed in time. So when a photon falls in and climbs out, there's no net uh, blue shift. However, if the universe starts to expand exponentially, that wipes out the gravitational potential. That actually causes space to expand so much that the gravitational potential goes to zero. So when a photon falls in, it gets blue shifted, and then it remains blue shifted. So this effect predicts that there will be a correlation between mass concentrations in the universe and the brightness of the microwave light which traveled through it. And so we proposed this in 96. Uh, again, it was very far from being observed. Finally, people have received, re uh, reached the precision to measure it and it's been confirmed at People debate the significance, but at something like five uh, sigma 
this effect has been observed. And so there is a completely independent physical effect of dark energy or cosmic acceleration, which has verified uh, that it is there. So yes, it seems to be there. It's really strange. And it basically tells us that we will never see, well, provided the dark energy really is a constant, we will never see more than a certain finite region of the universe. Okay, thank you very much. I see you, Thomas. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Thomas Conrad. I uh, have a question uh, concerning the vacuum energy. So, um, as we know, uh, the electromagnetic field, for example, can be uh, modeled as uh, uh, a lot of uh, non coupled harmonic oscillators. And each harmonic oscillator uh, in quantum mechanics has a ground state energy that is not zero. And then if you add all the ground state energies you would get infinity Correct. so uh, you are saying that uh, that these energies that i saw might be a candidate for dark energy uh, that they are kind of canceling and i I'd, I'd like to know whether you can explain further how they cancel thank you beautiful uh, let me see if i can share my screen again uh, hold on a second I, I'm, I'm going to show you a slide. Uh, yeah, thank you. You 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 explained it perfectly. Um, uh, question is whether I have the right slide. Uh, sorry, I can't find the right slide now. Uh, wait. Yeah, I don't have the right slide. Let let me explain it in words. Um, as you say, every, quant every field is a collection of harmonic oscillators, infinite collection, and the energy in every oscillation mode is, is given by h bar times the frequency of the mode. So, uh, so uh, the naive count of the energy in the vacuum is infinity. Now, uh, it turns out that bosons, like photons, contribute positively, and fermions, like the electron, contribute negatively, okay? But in the standard model, there are uh, roughly three times more fermions than bosons. So actually, the vacuum energy is negative infinity, okay? Maybe even more puzzling. So it has the wrong sign, okay? And it is way too big. It's hugely too big. Okay. So basically, it's a disaster. Now, people kind of learned how to subtract it mathematically. And this really makes no difference to any experiment except one involving gravity. But it's so hard to do experiments with gravity that in practice, we have to rely on the whole universe. You know, the biggest volume of dark energy is exactly our observable uh, horizon volume. And its total gravity can be detected. And that's the acceleration of rate of the universe. So it was only recently that we were able to detect the dark energy. And we have only done so by using the whole universe as the detector. Now, what is our new mechanism? So I claim that the first step is to get rid of this minus infinity, OK? Um, People did so using supersymmetry for, for the last four decades, but this was very uneconomical. You had to double the number of particles. For every boson, you had to have a fermion, which is not observed, and vice versa. So our mechanism involves a new type of field, not much exploited in, in particle physics, called a dimension zero field. Uh, so it, it, a usual scalar field, like the Higgs field, is dimension one. These guys are dimension zero. They're unusual because they have four derivatives in their Lagrangian instead of two. And what we discovered, more or less by accident, is that if you add these dimension zero fields, they have exactly the right properties to set the total vacuum energy to zero and to cancel the two, uh, what I call, trace anomalies which are other sort of pathologies uh, to do with coupling gravity. So they have this miraculous effect. 
By the way, it only works if there are precisely three generations of particles in the standard model. It, it works if there are three gen and only works if there are three generations. As far as I know, it's the simplest explanation for why there are three generations. Um, and actually the reason we even looked at these dimension zero fields is they have a spectrum of fluctuations in the vacuum which matches what we see in the cosmic microwave sky. This is a scale invariant pattern of Gaussian fluctuations. And uh, that I, I think is a very profound clue as to what's going on in the vacuum. Uh, in the vacuum. And these dimension zero fields have all kinds of other amazing effects. They don't have any particles, by the way. There's not a single particle associated with them. All they do is distort the vacuum. So the only effect of these fields is to make gravity coupled to, coupled to matter a bit more consistent. Uh, we've only just started to explore this. It's very, very encouraging. Um, very much more remains to be done. Okay, uh, thank you, Neil, for this very uh, uh, detailed answer, I believe, right? Um, okay, but but for the time, I think it's, uh, we'll over, run it over a little bit. And uh, thank you, Neil, for this very exciting talk. And uh, so let, let's give Neil applause and... Thank you. Sorry, Neil, there, we have run out of time, but there are a number of questions on the chat. So if you wouldn't mind just answering them on the chat for our online audience while we carry on. Uh, I know, Neil, you have a flight back to UK this afternoon, right? When, when, when is your flight? Hello? Uh, flight is at 6.40, 6 so, uh, so I can certainly yes. do it before the flight. I will answer all the questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we wish Neil a, a smooth trip back from Cape Town to UK. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank so, you very uh, much. I forgot to mention. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Yeah, I will see you in other cosmology events probably. Yeah. So um, I, I forgot to mention that this event is also sponsored and supported, strongly supported by NISEX, uh, my my friend Francesco Pochconi, uh, who is heading of uh, National Institute of Theoretical and Computational Science. Uh, this this is his uh, the NISEX banner. I'm also affiliate, and also SPIAS, the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies. So so let's thank both of the partner in organizing this whole thing. Uh, okay, so may I ask the rest of the audience to to switch off your cell phone or put your cell phone in, in airplane mode for the rest of the talk because it was disturbed disturb a little bit uh, for the for the first one. Okay, so let me uh, now switch to our second talk this afternoon, Professor Amita uh, Nohamed. So Amita, uh, let me put out the introduction. Yes, Amita is a theoretical physicist by training. She's uh, basically, currently an uh, associate professor at uh, of physics at the Univers University of Washington in the U.S., and he is also an uh, affiliate affiliated investigator at the uh, 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 this Fred uh, Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Right, uh, I believe that's a pronunciation. And she is a recipient of a career award for international uh, so for National Science Foundation NSF. Uh, in the and the MIRA award from the National Institute of Health of the USA. And she has recently received early career award from the American Physics Society, Division of Biological Physics. And the, uh, basically this award recognized outstanding and, uh, and sustained contribution by an early, early career researcher to biological physics. And the committee honored her for her creative development of the theoretical and data-driven approaches to the dynamics and evolution of the adaptive immune system, grounded in the non-equilibrium statistical physics and information theory. So I find I, I think this is a very interdisciplinary uh, subject uh, between physics and and biology. It's, it's wonderful to have uh, Amita here. So may um, Can you connect to internet by now? We managed to connect to internet. Okay. So then you you so can. We need a zoom. Link. You need to zoom. Yeah. Can you get, uh, log into the zoom? No, I need a link. You need a okay. Uh, where's uh, somehow manage the zoom. zoom link? Uh, can you send? Yeah, yeah. Just send it, but it's not coming. Uh, or you just you just log into zoom, maybe. Uh, I 
building my own Zoom link. Oh, uh, okay. It 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 need a Zoom. Uh, you need a Zoom uh, uh, ID and password. Just sign in with you. Just sign in with you. Use his one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. We got it. So, and how will she place her computer here or where? But just be careful, just be careful. I'd better not move because there are so many things. If, if there's something disconnected, it will be a big problem. Okay, let, let's let's put it here. Right. I connected, but I can't share anything. You you who, who is the host? Just give her give her a co-host. Yeah. Just one moment, and he will make you a co host. Just put it here. Can you put it here? That's this yeah, one. Maybe you can push this down here. Uh, but I'm just worried that this connection may drop. So, just why does it need to? All right. And let's see, drawing as a panelist. And uh, I can, I can. you can do it. Okay, good. All right. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. All right. Okay, please. Great. Um, yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ethan, for for sorry. sorry. So to this. Okay. All right. Share so, uh, hmm? You shared the sound. I did I share? No. Okay. 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 Hello again. Um, it's a true pleasure to be here. There's some my apologies. Uh, we need to use the microphone so the people in Zoom can hear you. Everybody. Here? Yeah. There's a there's an echo here. That's a problem. Yeah, 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 that
Yeah. Let me see downstairs. Let me see this downstairs. No, this is close. This is it's the one coming down here. You can just mute your Like this? There you go. Okay. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay, we're good. All right. So again, hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so this will be a very different talk. It'll be an interdisciplinary talk. Um, uh, as you just said, I'm I'm a physicist by training. I'm in physics and applied math department at University of Washington and also at the Fred Hodge Cancer Research Center. So you can see already interdisciplinarity in all my affiliations. And so since my PhD, I've been doing, you know, poking at, at all of these fields at the same time. And so hopefully I can, today I can give you a flavor of what we do. Um, so I decided to talk about something that, um, is there a way we can reduce yeah, so the size? I think that's on this end because it's not on my end. Uh, it's not uh, here. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I decided to talk about something quite new in my group. Uh, it still connects to all the old work that we've been thinking about, but um, you'll see that there is the sort of new flavor and it's in connection somewhat to the noble symposium we had on AI. And I thought it's fitting to kind of share those ideas with you. So as you just said, I'm interested in adaptive immune system. So this is a new era, well, not anymore new. In the past five, six years, I've been working quite a bit in this area. And it's, uh, I guess, by now everyone is expert in adaptive immunity after you know many years of dealing with COVID and immune response. So adaptive immune system is a fascinating process in our body that basically uses all possible biophysical features to protect us against pathogens. What we have is diverse repertoire of cells. So the main actors in adaptive immune system are B cells and T cells. And more or less every B cell and every T cell has its own unique receptor on its cell surface. And so the diversity of receptors that we have counter the diversity of pathogens that we encounter. And as a result of that, we can um, cover the space of pathogens that you will see, and we can even mount responses against pathogens that even didn't exist when we were born. So say COVID, right? And this is adaptively generated throughout our lifetime. It gets developed as we grow and as we um, encounter new pathogens. So we mount specific responses, and we also keep a memory of previous infections to be better uh, sort of more readily responding in the next encounter. So we have B cells, T cells, pathogenic epitopes on the other side and interactions between both of them. So um, maybe about 20, 30 years ago, there was this abstraction of immune, immune response or what's called immune shape space. It was introduced without actually being well characterized at the molecular level. So what's the idea? The idea is, you know, on the, there's a dual space. On the top is this thing called immune shape space. And in the bottom, we have antigenic or pathogenic shape space. So receptors on the top, when they're close to each other, it means that two receptors that are close, they can react with similar pathogens. And if you have two pathogens that are close to each other in the bottom sort of layer, then they can be recognized by similar antibodies, T cell receptors, T cell receptors. So this is an idea out there that people have been thinking about. No one knows, knows how many dimensions this system has. Basically, we don't really know of the structure of this shape space. There's also on top of that, there's this idea of there should be some holes in the space because we don't want to have self-reactive receptors, otherwise we will be autoimmune. But this is also being debated at the moment. There's a lot of self-reactive receptors in all of them and in all of us and we are just dynamically suppressing their response. So it's not quite right that self-reactivity is taken care of at the receptor level. Anyways, my 
goal in the past so many years have been to map out this immune shape space in some ways. And we have tried our luck with many different tools and data sets out there. So one very common data set that people, have been, including us, have been looking at it's been DNA sequences of these receptors because you can extract a lot of DNA now from the blood and read out in you know, a variation of these receptors. You can build co-evolutionary modeling. So Yinja mentioned non-equilibrium statistical physics, and that blends in there quite well. But we weren't, you know, successful in sort of in a satisfactory way to map out the shape space. We learned a lot of things, but not what we actually intended. So here comes the new thing. Um, these receptors are proteins, right? And pathogens, on the other hand, majority of pathogens we deal with are also proteins. So don't uh, get scared if you don't, if you're not familiar with these shapes. Usually, when you want to show proteins, you show this, you know, ribbons and things. So these represent three-dimensional shape of proteins. So in the bottom uh, left here, we have antibody protein or antibodies are basically detached B cell receptors. So these are B cell receptors interacting with a pathogenic protein. The next one is T cell receptor interacting with its own antigen and some presenting molecule. And uh, there are other kinds of molecules we deal with like lipids and stuff, but majority of stuff we, we, we see our immune systems is our proteins. So if you want to understand immune shape space, we actually need to understand protein shape space. So that's how the, this line of work started to get into understanding a general sort of understanding of a protein universe and use that to go down to understand immune receptors in particular. Okay. Well, when I start thinking about that, I'm not I'm no biochemist, I'm a theoretical physicist. So there, it was completely wishful thinking to start in doing biochemistry. So that was out, but I knew how to code. So I thought, why not? I can try to, to, uh, to uh, you know, use computers and machine learning because that's right now at the forefront of protein science to understand something about protein universe. So that's what you'll hear today. Okay. Before that, majority of you, I suppose, are physicists. So let me introduce what actual proteins are. Um, before I started this project, proteins to me were a bunch of letters, 20 amino acids, and I could write it down and theoretically treat them. And that was satisfactory enough for what I wanted. But in reality, they're molecules and they contain atoms. So carbon, carbon hydrogen, nitrogen, various things. And generally, each amino acid, as you can see here, they have a backbone, and the backbones are the same for all amino acids. But then you also have side chains, and side chains basically are the features that differ from one protein to another. And you know, we are not going to go into detail of how they look different, but they're, they really chemically look different from each other, and they have different properties. So the information initially is encoded well, in DNA, then to amino acid sequence, and then you basically fold the amino acid sequence in a three dimension, so territory structure, which then determines protein function. So you have this hierarchy of events, you go from sequence to structure to function. And function may be interaction of two proteins or something like that. So as I mentioned, there has been a lot of work in recent years, especially in machine learning uh, using you know, AI basically in protein science. And I think one famous one is uh, the protein folding channel uh, challenge. There's been a challenge for the past 50 years. So going from a sequence to a protein structure. So our body does that. If you start from a sequence, you put it in a living organism, it falls into a protein structure. Why can't we be able to do that on a computer? So in the past 50 years, it hasn't been really a successful endeavor. A lot of smart people have been working on that. But then um, AlphaFold came along and it made a huge leap in, in folding a protein. So this is run by DeepMind uh, in, in London, which is basically a Google uh, a sort of science, uh, science camp more or less. And they have done a lot of other things in uh, solving Go and various things, but also protein folding was one of the one of their projects. And uh, yeah, so they can now fold proteins with 90% accuracy or more. And 
and it's it's pretty amazing what they have managed to do. But aside from this sequence to structure map, if you wish, there has been also a lot of work uh, trying to go from sequences to actual function of a protein. So these work, I think there are many different flavors of them, but a lot of them are inspired by what we call language models. So language models are things we use every day when we Google something, right? Um, and the idea is there is to, well, in computer science, the idea was there to, to, to understand or to model the distribution of words in natural languages. And, um, you know, just briefly, if I want to kind of characterize what these language models do, you give some, you train your neural network with a bunch of text, you try to understand a low dimensional representation of your text. So a picture down here is trying to reflect what, what a network could learn. It's a wrong picture, but it gives you a good idea. So let's say I'm, I have a vector associated with man, a vector associated with royal, and I add these two up and it should give, give me a king. And if I have a woman plus royal, it should give me a queen, right? So that's kind of an idea of representation or low dimensional representation. Now, protein scientists thought, okay, this is a great idea, it's super successful. Why not we feed in uh, protein sequences instead of Shakespeare, right? And what do we get out of that? So a lot. Uh, so if you do that, you can try to predict, um, you know, uh, evolutionary processes in proteins. You can try to predict viral escape. And there has been examples of successful efforts in both of these stories. So this is all good. We can probably go home if we can do everything. But the reality is uh, we're still far away. We still don't know why each of these models quite work and what exactly they're capturing. And so in a sense, as scientists, we want to understand what's going on. And also, they don't solve everything. So in a practical sense, we are also not yet there. So I mentioned to you, we have a sequence to structure to a function map, uh, right? So that's just the biology. We have AlphaFold that does sequence to structure. We have these natural language processing models that go from sequence to function. But if you go from sequence to function, it means that the model you're inferring also has knows something about sequence to structure. So it's a bit of a convoluted model, right? It captures the stuff from the first step and the second step, and that's not so great. Now, nowadays that we have so many protein structures either available experimentally or computationally, the idea for us was, can we just start from protein structure and try to predict function without you know, thinking about sequence at all, right? Someone gave me the structure uh, as a as a physicist, I would never know what this structure does, but also most biochemists can't tell you what the protein would do given a protein structure. So that's that's the question. So to be more concrete, let's say I have I give you the same antibody and antigen protein co-crystallized structure. So something like this, both together. And so by that, it means I give you coordinates of all the atoms and identity of all the atoms in both sides. Can you tell me what's the binding affinity between these two proteins? Can you improve the binding affinity by changing one side a little bit? So these are concrete question. You can call it engineering question. If you wanna understand better how things work, maybe it's a physics question, but yeah. So you can ask these type of question and try to answer them. So that's what I mean by structure to function. All right. So people have been thinking about the structure to function map. Um, I think the most intuitive way of thinking about machine learning approaches, like when you're doing machine learning, you start off with existing methods. Generally, when you do physics, you start off with the existing method. And a lot of machine learning has been developed in the context of pattern recognition and image processing, right? And so the first effort for a structure to function map has been, let's treat these protein structures as three-dimensional images and try to parse that in the same way. So when you look at the image, you have pixels of the image and you sort of put zeros and one in your image, right? So numbers associated with like maybe colors within a pixel. So for protein structures, now you have a 3D cubes, right? Instead of pixelizing, you voxelize, which is three-dimensional pixels. So you have different atoms, so they come in different cubes, each one for, for its own atom. And so that would be a representation of a protein structure. 
And so say I have a bunch of proteins with different binding pockets here, different colors, right? And so they come with measurements of binding energy of that binding pocket to some, some other protein. And I wanna build a machine learning algorithm that relates the left-hand side to the right-hand side, right? You can do that. So people have done versions of this. And so to do this, you have to do some, you have to sort of take some steps. You first wanna maybe orient all your proteins in the same directions because otherwise things become arbitrary. Machines are not you know, as smart as we are looking at different orientations and feeling things shouldn't depend on the global orientation. You need to bin the data. And so also if I input one orientation and learn only for one orientation, that's not enough because then someone else come and give a slightly rotated version of protein, you get competing nonsense out of the learned model. So you train a model with many different rotated version of the input, and that's called data augmentation. Because in that case, you're sort of guaranteed you, you get the same answer if you train it this way. But it's also computationally very costly because rotation in 3D, you can do many different orientations, right? Um, and I think a more fundamental problem with this is that it is not guaranteed that the model you're learning is independent of the orientation. So in principle, your network could learn one model for every single orientation. And that's the extreme, but you can go somewhere in between. So that's not desirable as a physicist, right? My energy model should not depend on global orientation. So in a sense, I need to have a neural network that would respect this global rotational symmetry in the data. And that's what we were after. So satisfying rotational symmetry while learning whatever task I'm trying to learn. Okay. So here's, here's the problem. I wanna respect rotational symmetry on the way I wanna also avoid this voxelization, the spinning of the data, because it's computationally very uh, inefficient way of treating this data sets. Data is very sparse. And that's what, what I'll tell you in, in this talk. So how do we go about do this? OK, so symmetry has a long history in physics. So as physicists, we kind of respect symmetry in our daily lives, right? So this is a picture of Emmy Noether. Uh, as Yinja mentioned, I spent some time in Göttingen. And Emmy Noether is a very known mathematician in Göttingen and also in the world. So in her paper in 1918, uh, she basically drew analogy between symmetry and conservation laws, right? So when we have time translation of symmetry, you have energy conservation, translation symmetry, momentum conservation, and rotational symmetry, then uh, conservation of angular momentum. Now, around the same time, we have Albert Einstein, uh, who spent some of his time in Göttingen, but this was not during that time, um, who introduced the principle of covariance. So what is the principle of covariance? It says the laws of nature should not depend on your reference frame, right? If I make a measurement in one reference frame, I should have a theory that would describe it in another reference frame. And so the popular examples here are equivariance between electricity of magnetism. If I measure, uh, if I'm static with respect to a charge, I, me I only measure electric field. If the charge is moving, I measure both electric and magnetic field. And so if you go to a Minkowski representation, you have a theory that basically uh, states that these two are equivar uh, equivariant. So you have a full theory. Same goes for acceleration and gravity, right? So I want a machine learning algorithm that does this thing properly that has the equivariance between the two. Okay, so, you know, in machine learning and computer science, these ideas existed before, but mainly in the domain of, again, image processing and in two dimensions. And in that case, you mainly think about uh, translation in 2D. So if you don't know anything about machine learning, you know that in machine learning, people want to classify cats and dogs, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's the main objective. So um, yeah, so you train a network on images of cats and dogs, and then usually you do it on natural images. So cats can be across different places in the image, dogs the same way. And so you don't want your network to be super sensitive of where the head or the nose of the dog or a cat is, right? And uh, yeah, this is my dog, <laughs> Lito. And so what, uh, what we had here was 
you know, in convolutional neural networks that are pretty efficient in doing the classification, you have this um, convolutional filters. So the filters are small, uh, sort of a bunch of pixels, basically, that's the size of a filter. And you can go with a small, with this small filter throughout the image and pick up features of the image. So if you're now hitting a nose filter, irrespective of where the nose is, uh, a nose filter and a nose of a dog give you a larger signal. And so the eye filter and a eye of a dog, irrespective of where the eye is, gives you a signal of existence of eye at that spot. So then you can convolve these filters, right, the outputs, and then you can pull the data. So you do some linear and nonlinear operations, and voila, you can classify cat and dog. Um, so yeah, so in a sense, uh, machine learning or computer science have thought about translation of symmetry. What we wanted to do is thinking about the rotation symmetry and in three dimensions. So I've used the term equivariance kind of loosely in this talk, and I want to introduce what exactly it means mathematically. Um, so let's start from simpler thing, invariance. So imagine we have a water molecule here, right? And the atomic mass of a water molecule is an invariant of orientation of water molecule. I think that's intuitive. So if I rotate my water molecule, I have a function f. I, I claim this function is invariant of, uh, of the rotation. So the rotation, I express it with this operator dr1 for the water molecule. And the atomic mass is now um, you know, transformed by identity operator. So it's invariant. So equivariance is, uh, is a more general form of invariance. Um, so instead of atomic mass, let's assume you're looking at dipole moments, right? When you rotate your uh, your molecule, your dipole moment should also rotate. So you know you have two different operators in this case because the first one operates in the space of water molecules, and the second one the space of dipole moments. And so you have a well-defined operator that tells you if I rotate the object how the output of the function rotates, right? And it is a linear operator in this case, and that's why we're kind of interested in this because we can use it for many different purposes. Okay, so this is rotational equivariance maybe in one sentence. <laughs> and what I will do uh, for the protein problem is I will have a protein structure. I will learn first, or try to tell you how I will do that, uh, how to learn a, um, rotationally equivariant encoding of the structure. So how do I encode the structure? And then how do I process the encoded structure to learn a model. So the second step would be a neural network. The first step would be whatever encoding I'm doing. And then how do I use this learned model to predict anything functional? And so I think some of you are physicists. You may know that if you're thinking about rotation and equivariance, rotational equivariance or rotational symmetry, you might it might be useful to think about spherical harmonics, you know. So and we'll we'll make an analogy there to your knowledge of quantum mechanics back in the days. Okay, so you'll see a lot of spherical harmonics in, in the next few slides. All right, so yeah, symmetry, uh, generally Fourier representation is a useful thing when we have symmetry in a problem. So a normal sort of wave dynamics that we teach in classrooms, right? Uh, trans we have translation of symmetry, and so we do a normal Fourier transform, right, with the e to the ikx. And so it takes you from a time domain to a frequency domain. If you have a normal wave, you get a single number out. And it's a perfect representation of that wave. Now, if you have rotational symmetry, the Fourier transform would involve spherical harmonic as your basis, right? And so this is also in 3D spherical space uh, coordinate system, right? And you get you know, two coefficients, the degree and rank of your associated with degree and rank of your spherical harmonics. And you have these structures because you know L is integer and M goes from minus L to L. So you get triangles out of it. So, um, so this is what we learn in quantum mechanics when we want to represent angular momentum, especially, right? Writing hydrogen atom and things like that. Uh, but then mathematically, this spherical harmonics, these YLMs are also quite useful because they are irreducible representation of SO3. So SO3 is a group that is rotations around the fixed origin, right? 
a, frick, a fixed reference point, so all rotations. And so if you have an irreducible representation, that means you can have this, um, this operator for the equivariance operator that is linear and it can give you how you exactly transform when you transform your object. And from, from quantum mechanics, we know the operator. It's a Wigner D matrix, right? So we know exactly how to write this. So here, is, here it is. If I make a linear transformation, so if I rotate my object, um, I have a spherical harmonic and it transforms with a Wigner D matrix. And to be pedantic, Wigner D matrix is actually the representation of SO3, not spherical harmonics, because representations are matrices. But uh, but generally it is it is that. So that that serves us with linear operation of our neural networks. That's how we operate you know, linearly. But then we have nonlinearity. So neural networks um, are known to be expressive because they have a lot of nonlinear operations. So if you have done any machine learning, you are maybe familiar with terms like ReLU or sine function or things like that, right? So different nonlinear shapes that you apply. So if you apply any of those things in the spherical Fourier space on this kind of signal, you lose rotational equivariance. But again, from quantum mechanics, we know there are ways of combining your angular momenta. And so the way we do that in quantum mechanics is klebsch gordon tensor products, right? So spin-spin interactions. And so you can do exactly that um, for nonlinearity in your neural network. And so these two components basically give you how to linearly transform and nonlinearly transform your objects. And so we didn't come up with all of these things. Um, the, since 2016, there has been a small niche now, a very growing niche of computer scientists, some of them physicists, who um, were interested in, in understanding symmetry in neural networks. They call it group equivariant machine learning or geometric deep learning. And so we had Max Welling actually last, last week um, in uh, Stellenbosch, uh, who gave a fantastic talk, but there were also others, Risi Condor, Taco Cohen, Tess Schmidt, and many others who've been working in this area and developing really strong mathematical foundation. And so that inspired us quite a bit. Um, so to use these ideas to do something about protein. So that's where some of these ideas come from. Okay, so we have all the all the ingredients. Um, so here's the problem we want to solve as a first first problem, right? Um, I want to learn statistics of protein microenvironments. I will be specific what it is in a minute, but I want to basically solve Lego pieces, Lego pieces of a protein structure. So here's a protein structure, and you'll see now. Uh, amino acid in this protein structure is now highlighted in orange. So now I take all the atoms of this uh, amino acid off the structure. So I mask the amino acid and I look at the surrounding of that amino acid in the protein structure and keep the atoms, let's say in 10 angstrom around that center amino acid. So I'm now gonna ask the question, can I predict the identity of that amino acid that I have masked given everything around it? So why is this an important question uh, or a useful question to ask? It is because effectively we're trying to learn an effective potential in this protein environment to determine what should sit there, right? And so if we learn that, then we can do a lot of other things with it. So let's see if we can do it. So here's the input, my protein neighborhood or microenvironment with amino acid at the center mask. I, uh, for sort of simplicity, let's look at only the carbon atoms in that environment. So you can think about it as a point cloud in 3D, bunch of carbons, presence or absence, and you can define this density of carbons as, I, you can write the density function, which is a sum of bunch of delta functions, whether you're present or not. So the first step is to encode this structure and we wanna encode it using our spherical harmonics, but the spherical harmonics only take care of the angular parts, right? Um, we need to also take care of the radial component of these atoms, right? How far you're from the center. And so for that, you need a radial expansion. Um, there are many different ways of doing this. So we use Zernike uh, polynomials to do that. And Zernikes are known in, uh, in optics. Um, Zernike got a Nobel Prize um, 
I don't remember on what, but he got a Nobel Prize uh, in physics. Um, yeah, so effectively you get three coefficients, Lm that come from YLM, from the spherical harmonic, and N that takes care of your radial component. So three different integers, and there are some constraints of what these numbers can be. So instead of having one triangle from one spherical harmonic, now you have N of these triangles for all the radial components. And so then you do it for all your uh, atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, hydrogen, and also some of the properties of these atoms, like how close they are to the surface called SASA or charge. So you can you can do whatever game you want to do with this to encode the information, right? So the interesting thing about this Zernike uh, transformation is that the thing you get out of it is actually a transposition of some uh, of spherical holograms. So if you were to build a real hologram out of these atoms, and then you know transpose them on top of each other, you get something like like this Zernike transform. So for branding, we call our encoding a holographic encoding of our protein microenvironment. Um, so I think that's that's a fun name to call these things. Yeah. So these holograms are inputs to our neural network, right? So we start off with the amino acid, the the point clouds, the Fourier holograms. And then I, I pass these holograms that were the input to a neural network that is now rotationally equivariant. So that means you have your, uh, your Wigner D matrices and your Krebs Gordon products to operate on these holograms. And you collect a bunch of invariants, so L equals zeros of different layers. You pass it through some dense layers. So it's a bit technical. I'm happy to talk about it later, whoever is interested. And so the output, uh, so I'm training this network, the weights of this network. And so the output I get, um, first I get some sort of scores or what I call pseudo energies for different types of amino acids. So it gives me gives me how, uh, how each amino acid, what's the score or a preference for having a different type of amino acid out of the 20 in that neighborhood. And then I run it through a Fermi function, a sigmoid function, softmax, wherever you come from, you call this function slightly differently to get probabilities out, right? And so that, that's a normalized vector that gives you relative probability of different amino acids for that neighborhood. So I'm gonna use this term pseudo energy because I'll take this a bit seriously as energy and use it in the next slide and see how whether or not it's a real energy. Uh, but yeah, so this is basically the whole formalism. You train a network, you optimize your weights to based on input from all protein structures that you have in protein data bank and try to see what you get out of it. So let's see what we get out of it. So the first task is, you know, if I train the network and then test it on a different set of protein structures, can I predict the, you know, the amino acid that sit in there accurately? And the answer is, yeah, it's pretty accurate. It's 70% accurate. So the, the matrix you're seeing here, uh, on the vertical side is the input amino acids and the horizontal side are the predicted amino acids. The best case scenario, 100% would be all diagonal, right? But we have some freedom, so it's like, 30% lack of accuracy. But uh, what, what we see is actually, um, you know, the confusion that we see in the network is quite consistent with the physiochemical properties and the size of these amino acids. So if you look at the clusters that we have here, so say hydrophobic cluster, oops. Okay, hydrophobic cluster here, we have a, medium-sized hydrophobics and small-sized hydrophobics clustered together. And so the other properties as well. So the way we are confusing things actually makes sense. Um, the 70% accuracy is equivalent to state-of-the-art accuracy when people do this voxelization, uh, you know, the, the image processing thing, but it is orders of magnitude faster. So to give you a sense, other people, so with the image processing, they use, you know, six GPUs, two weeks of training to get the same result we do with one GPU in a few hours, 
right? So why is that? The reason is that we are not looking over a whole model space, rather we'll, we're constraining our models to be rotationally equivariant to respect symmetry. As a result, we get a lot of computational benefit out of this. Um, so yeah, so this is a task we set about to solve. We solved it. What do we get out of it? What are the features of the model that we have learned? So the first thing I went on about was we have symmetry, symmetry relates to physics, right? Do we get anything physical out of the model that we have learned, right? So the, the easy way of testing if, if our energies are physical is that, okay, is our networks living in some energy potential that, that is consistent with our intu intuition? And what is our intuition? The proteins that we see have been evolving for so many millions of years, and um, they're probably somewhat optimal, the neighborhoods that you're seeing. Um, so if I perturb the neighborhood around the amino acid, I should increase the energy. So basically, is the true neighborhood in an energy minimum of the network? And so that's the question we can ask. So we can distort the neighborhood, and you can do it in many different ways. We did it by sheer perturbation of a protein. You move to backbone angles. So what exactly it does is that you're doing a shearing here in, at, this, at this residue down here. So the protein kind of gets distorted a little bit. And so we ask if I do the shearing, do you see the energy that I calculate to, uh, you know, for the native structure to be at the minimum of the energy landscape? Okay, so how do we test this? We have a protein up here, it's being sheared. You can calculate the energy using the already trained network. You can look at the change in the energy due to shear, native structure versus you know, the shear the structure, and you can look at the distortion in the protein structure due to your shear. And what we see here is that this is now for a protein called protein G. It's a relatively small protein. At 56 sites of the protein, you can shear it at different sites. Generally, your energy landscape is quadratic with a zero with a minimum set at zero distortion, indicating that we have probably learned something that is akin to energy potential. Uh, or physical potential. So this was not our intention. We haven't trained the network to learn physics, but it seems to have learned physics. And that's kind of exciting, and we can probably use it to do other things with it. Our goal was to learn functions. So have we learned anything functional about these amino acids? So we've tested func function question uh, in many different ways. So I'll show you a few examples just to highlight. Um, so the first example is basically a model system of protein structures called a T4 lysozyme protein. Um, and the reason it's um, interesting, well, for us, it's a, it's a useful model system is that there are many mutants of these protein available out there. And by mutant, you just change one amino acid to another, right? And uh, along with the mutant sequence, you also have structure of that new mutant. So I can see how much the structure has changed after that mutation. So this is a wild type T4 lysozyme. I'm highlighting here two amino acids, one in orange, one in purple. And so on the right-hand side, we have a mutation from orange to yellow, which is a neutral mutation. It does not impact the stability of protein. And on the, uh, the other mutation from purple to pink, it's a destabilizing mutation. So it distorts the protein structure or stability. And so we have 40 of these protein structures available for T4 lysozyme. It's unique. Um, and so this is more or less the summary statistics if you look at our predictions for these different variants. So it's a convoluted picture. So let me just walk you through it. So on the vertical axis, you have these different mutants. So for example, the way to read this is that I3Y, it means that there's an amino acid mutation from I in the wild type structure at position three to Y in the mutant structure, right? And so on the left-hand side, I have um, predictions from the network assuming that everything is on the wild type structure. So what's the probability of seeing a different 20 amino acids that we have? This alpha is possible 20 amino acids. These are on the x-axis. Log probability of that minus log probability of wild type on the wild type structure, just to, you know, there's a gauging variance here. You want to zero something. And then on the right hand side, you do the same extra exercise, but using the corresponding mutant structure. And so 
a quantity that measures stability of proteins, if you remember your chemistry is delta delta G, right? And uh, if you were to calculate that, you want to calculate the probability of seeing a mutant mutation, a specific mutation on the mutant sequence or a structure minus probability of seeing wild type on the wild type structure. And so, and so that's what's plotted here. And so the, the more red you have, the more destabilizing the effect and the more blue is the more stabilizing or beneficial the effect. And what we see is that destabilizing category that you know experimentalists told us tend to be all pretty red and neutral or mildly beneficial ones are tend to, they tend to be blue. And so if you look at actually delta delta G versus prediction, we have a very good agreement between measurements. So uh, predicting a stability effect of mutations has been a very difficult task. AlphaFold is not successful in doing that because it's not trained to do that, for example. Older methods use some uh, physical models to do that um, and are not necessarily that successful. So we're quite excited about this because again, our model was not trained to do this task. It's just a consequence of what we have learned so we can do this. Um, the other thing we managed to do is looking at protein and um, ligand or small molecule um, structures. So we can look at data sets that have a protein and together with a light small molecule and with their corresponding binding energy. So dissociation constant, KD. And so what we can do is we can ask whether our network can predict the binding affinity in this structure. So in this case, I go around this ligand or binding pocket and I take 10 angstrom neighborhoods around it. And I look at the protein with the ligand and without the ligand and calculate the difference in the energy that my network is reporting. So if this energy was truly the binding energy, I would expect this to be proportional to logarithm of KD or minus logarithm of KD in this way, right? So it's a minus log K, so a change in energy, and there's a factor L, which is your chemical potential. So the longer it is, you have a long uh, sort of entropic effect, so to speak. And so you can just plot this thing against each other and see what you get. You get about 50% correlation without doing any fine tuning with this analysis. So that's kind of impressive on its own. You can do a little bit of fine tuning to learn scale, energy scales for different amino acids separately. So learn another 40 numbers, so to speak. And so you can boost up your prediction to about 65%. So this is again, in a sense, what in computer science they call zero shot prediction. We are not really fitting an extra model for any of this consequence of original model. Okay, so the last example that I show you is something going back to immune receptors, so in this case, T cell receptor. And, um, and so this is very much a prelimi preliminary analysis. So we were quite encouraged by the structure of our network and we wanted to see, can we say something about immune receptors with that? So T cell receptor interaction with peptide and this molecule called HLA, which is expressed on all our cells basically, is um, surprisingly a difficult problem if we were to cal calculate the binding affinity between the two. The peptides tend to be small. They're like 10, 11 amino acid long, something like that. But we and others have tried to predict you know, what peptide binds to what T cell receptor or TCR. And as from the sequence, and it's been very, very difficult. And why is it an interesting problem? Because uh, currently uh, you might have heard about cancer immunotherapy and cancer vaccines using antigens that would then buy, using your immune system basically to target cancer cells. And so there, it's a really a problem of design. So how well a cancer immunotherapy would work given the peptides that you're presenting in your body given the epitopes of the cancer. And so knowing whether the immunotherapy would work or not would, you know, would be quite cost efficient in terms of therapy. And you don't want to put people on the therapy knowing that it's not going to work on them. So that's that's one thing. And then on the, on the other side, you want to be able to design peptides that actually trigger immune response. So that's why a lot of people are interested in this. And so we thought, okay, maybe we can use our model to see whether we can predict binding of peptides to TCR. So here's sort of a cartoon of the problem. We, uh, we take a TCR structure, HLA structure, or this HLA molecule, 
and then the peptide we I'll be done in two minutes. So HLA molecule and the peptide. And so I, I strip out uh, sort of all the atoms of the peptide. So I have basically a line that tell me where it goes more or less. And then I use my model to sample peptides from all this based on their energies, right? Based on their pseudo energies. So I sample from our model from holographic convolutional neural network. Then I relax these structures together using all existing tools. I iterate until convergence. So this is one way of representing what we did versus what the experiments do. It's a bit, um, I don't like it personally the way they do it, but uh, that's how, how you represent peptide distribution in biology. So on the top, this is an experiment done on this particular set of molecules. On, and the result is from 26 different bound peptides. So these are all good peptides. And at each position, you have, in principle, you can have 20 different amino acids, and the sort of length of these letters is proportional to the probability of these amino acids, and the colors show somewhat the properties. So out of the 26, this is sort of the structure you get. Uh, our prediction is below, so we are not limited to 26, so we get a lot more variability. We get uh, the sort of large scale structure quite right. So you get the G's and the I and L and various things. Um, you get the color certainly right. So it's quite encouraging without any fine tuning, that's what we get out of this. And so it's not even quite converge actually for this particular result. But uh, but yeah, so that's something we're currently working on, try to really design peptides for these co-crystallized structures. Okay, so what I've told you so far, well, today, basically, uh, it's been on uh, these Lego pieces of proteins, right? Protein structures, protein structure to function map, but at this single amino acid level. And so the goal here really moving forward is to take these Lego pieces and build larger structures. And so we are doing that by, by putting these uh, equivariant representations that we have on, on, on graphs. And so letting these amino acids start talking to each other in this reduced representation space, looking at how T cell receptor actually bind to different pathogens, B cell receptors bind to different pathogens or general protein-protein interactions. So this has been a lot of fun for us. And so we are, we are really excited as what, what can come, uh, come next. With this, I'll thank all the group members that have been involved, especially Michael Poon here who, single-handedly drove this project because when we started, we didn't know anything about proteins or machine learning. So that was our way of getting in both fields. And I think it was a bit of a detour, but we, we learned some things on the way. Um, and now basically a lot of people in the group got in, interested in, in this line of project. And so all the people who are both based are somewhat involved in various aspects of this project and also our collaborators. Phil Bradley and Jakub Otvinovsky. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. Thank you, um, Amitam, for this very good uh, talk. And uh, so, yeah, any, any audience uh, any audience question, please talk. Yeah, okay. okay. So, yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. So thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I got a question concerning the densities that you mentioned. You said you uh, expand them in terms of spherical harmonics and Zernike polynomials. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, if I may comment, I think Zernike got his Nobel Prize for phase contrast microscopy in the 50s. Okay, great. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, I saw that you that you had this modeling in terms of uh, the Zernike polynomials and the spherical harmonics for different distributions. So you had the, the carbon atoms and then some other atoms, uh, I don't know, oxygen or whatever. And then I didn't understand what you did with them in order to get the full thing. I mean, so how do you put these different uh, distributions together in order to get the function or the, yeah, the function in the end. You can think, Thank you. We can think about the input to a neural network as a very large tensor, right? And so each of these 
triangles, you just open them up. So you, you make sure, you know, F00 of green color, the first row is always at position one and the red color is always at position 10. So you make sure you, you do this consistently always. But then, yeah, so you just take all the numbers and make a giant tensor out of it. And that'll be just input to your neural network. And so then it'll be processed in an equivariant way. So that means you're not, so the, so I didn't go into detail of that. So what coefficients you can combine with each other, you're constrained by that, right? You want to, you only want to combine coefficients that have the same L and M to make sure things are equivariant because they, they, otherwise they'd be transformed with different Wigner D matrices, right? So with that, with that constraint, the matrix operation that you have will be, you know, you have a lot of zeros, but you know where the zeros are. So you fix that and then everything else you learn. So that's that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Any more <clears throat> any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, let's see whether there's any question online. Uh, Sally, you may help to read. Are you online, Sally? Yeah. None question. Okay. Where is your biology friend? It's in the in the. Uh, it's online. So um, I think we were very clear. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, that's practical. All right. Okay. Uh, so your professor friend has no questions. Uh, it seems. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, I think uh, we basically conclude these two talks, and uh, for the, I mean, for the rest of the proceeding is the following. Um, we basically. Okay, uh, see you guys who are online. Uh, the rest of the uh, procedure is following. We will have a short introduction for from our physics faculty for what we are doing, because this event is intent to be more integrated with our physics uh, 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 staff here in, 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 in our school. So basically I will call on uh, several of you uh, physics staff uh, to have a short introduction of what we're doing here. So uh, to let international guests to know Know that uh, hopefully we'll build more collaboration in the future. Okay. And let's, oh, by the way, let's send our speaker again. Here is our present for you. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so now let's, how, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you may just sit over here if you want, or maybe, yeah, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, what? Next talk. Uh, pardon what? Next talk, Yeah, we, we can have a break for, for 10 minutes. And uh, please, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then, then I will call you, uh, uh, I will call you back. Yeah.